Before we go any further on this Bergdahl story, I have to say something about the press's role here. This story is not just about whether he deserted. His actions may have been deplorable. We have to wait and hear his side of the story. But it's not just about him. This story, at its heart, is about ending the wars that have defined the first 14 years of this American century. And it is also about facing the moral and legal consequences of holding so many prisoners for so long at Guantanamo Bay. Here's something to keep in mind, something I wish the press had made more clear this week in the coverage. I fact-checked this with the State Department on Friday. These five Taliban prisoners, uh, they were released partly because the Obama administration concluded it could not press charges against them, that it did not have the evidence to put them on trial. We, the public, have turned away from Gitmo. We've definitely turned away from Afghanistan. But the press can, and the press should, pull us back. The press should encourage us to pay attention to these issues. I think the media has an educational role to play here. As President Obama said on Monday, this is what happens at the end of wars. But sometimes that's hard to see when you watch TV and all you hear is, well, fear-mongering. News accounts that don't include all the context here are incomplete, but they're worse than that. They're misleading to the people that are watching and reading them. Which brings me to something else that's been misleading. Reporters pretending that they discovered something brand new about Bergdahl's disappearance. Because a lot of what you've heard in the past week was actually first reported years ago by Rolling Stone magazine. In this 2012 article by acclaimed writer Michael Hastings, he talked about a lot of these issues. Unfortunately, Bergdahl did not get a lot of press attention when he was in captivity. In fact, we talked about that. We called his case undercovered here on Reliable Sources back in February. But Hastings, he was on it. Unfortunately, he died when his car crashed in Los Angeles last year. But he had a partner on this story, a former infantryman named Matthew Farwell. Farwell was deployed to Afghanistan for 16 months. He helped Hastings with a lot of the reporting about Bergdahl, and I spoke with him earlier about the press's role. Matthew Farwell joins me now here. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. You called this the most important story you've ever written. Why is that? And probably ever will write. Well, because it deals with eternal themes. I mean war, captivity, problems, and because we wrote it at a time two years ago, Michael Hastings and I wrote this for Rolling Stone, nobody covered it, nobody cared, and people were being shut up by the White House about it. And Tell me what you mean by that. How were they being shut up? Uh, one of my White House sources was in charge of coordinating the getting the press to not write about this story. To not talk too much about him. And what were the exactly. reasons for that? Was I would think it might be because they were concerned that it would affect the negotiations that were underway. Officially, that's the story. But because it reflects badly on the military and on a failed war in Afghanistan. You're saying that the White House and the Pentagon as well tried to keep the story of Bo Bergdahl's captivity quiet. Right. So what did they say to you? Did they try to do that to you and Michael Hastings as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're still apparently being investigated by the FBI. It's interesting to think about how this story you wrote two years ago with Michael Hastings hasn't ended. It's still something that is ongoing. It's still being talked about. Right. I and we agonized about it. And, you know, Michael and I both considered it the most important thing we'll ever write. And we had a real hard time doing it because the kid was still in captivity, you know, and we didn't know if it would help or hurt him. And we sat with his parents for six and a half hours. His parents came to my brother's funeral in Idaho. Mm. We have an emotional bond with these people. I love the Bergdahl family. They're great people. I don't know Bo. You know, I hope to meet him one day. And I'm not sure how that'll go because I'm a former infantryman. <laughs> and, you know, uh, we'll have some issues. We'll talk about Paktika. But the Bergdahl family is a great family. And they're an all-American family, and all this stuff that's been coming out about them is disgusting. So I think you're referring to people like Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity, who have raised questions about the beard, said that he looks Muslim. When you've heard those comments, how have you reacted? Well, I've thought that they're racist, first of all, because I have Muslim friends. Muslims can be good Americans as well. But Bob Bergdahl is the most Christian man you'll ever meet. And he grew the beard because his son was being held hostage by the Taliban and by the Haqqani network, and he was trying to get better treatment for his son. This is where 
I hone in on the point about the public and the press not being aware enough of Bo Bergdahl's status for five years. Right. We hear, we heard so much this week right. from pundits who have suddenly decided they know what happened. Right. But where were they during these five years? Exactly. And, you know, the other thing that should be brought up is the fact that the soldiers in his unit were under a blanket gag order, a non-disclosure agreement that they were all forced to sign. Yeah, that's a very important point, so that they wouldn't talk about the circumstances right. of his disappearance. Right, they were literally on the tarmac at Bagram signing this paper, mm. saying they wouldn't talk about it, so that they could go home. And now they're finally free to talk. We got, we got quite a few of them to talk two years ago, but to not be able to talk about your deployment for five years? That's ridiculous, and that's awful. For many years, we've heard about a disconnect between the press and the military. Uh, do you sense that disconnect, and what is the significance of it, if so? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's not only a disconnect between the press and the military, and I'm a former infantryman. I spent five years in the Army as a soldier. You know, I pulled the trigger on people in Afghanistan. But there's not only a disconnect between the press and the military, there's a disconnect between the American public and the military. It has bothered me for years that there aren't more reporters in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, CNN has a bureau. The other networks sort of have bureaus. They don't always have full-time correspondents in the country, even though we're still fighting a war there. Right. And, and there aren't many independent reporters that are off base that aren't embedded with U.S. forces. Interesting, so it's not enough to be in Kabul. You also have to be with the troops, you're saying? No, 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 no. I'm saying that you have to not be with the troops. You have to be independent. Look at Matthew Akins. He's a Rolling Stone reporter. He's written for Harper's before. He wrote a great story for Rolling Stone that won the Polk Award earlier about uh, war crimes committed by U.S. special forces. Mm. And how much how much press coverage did that get? Mm. But he's completely independent. He doesn't buy any line that anybody gives him. And the rest of the people show up to a press briefing at 10 a.m. and then go eat omelets in the Bagram Airfield you know, dining hall. Mm. They're completely craven and they're completely reliant on the military for their news. The quote from President Obama that I thought was the most important one of all, I'm trying to pull it up so I don't botch it. He said at that press conference earlier in the week, this is what happens at the end of wars. Exactly. And to I, me, that's also the missing context in well, the past seven days. Well, and that's, that's one of the things I want to say, too, is when Michael was writing that article two years ago, he included the line that it is with Bo that this war is likely to end. And at the time, I was like, dude, I don't know. But it turned out he was really, really prescient and... You know, I miss Michael. I wish he were around to be talking about this because I'm a poor substitute, frankly. I wish he was here to see Bo return. Uh, I think he'd do a hell of an interview with him. Yeah. But maybe you will. Too early to tell. Yeah, I agree with you on that 100%. Matt, thanks for being here and sharing the story. Thank you very much for having me.